Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you all. Nice that the weather's cooled down a little bit for us, that it's not 40 degree humidex today. It's a little easier to get out and about. My name's Elizabeth. I'm the manager from home dialysis and the kidney care center, which is pre-dialysis. And today I am very happy to have joining us Mark Hebert. Mark is here from the Ontario Renal Network. The Ontario Renal Network is part of Cancer Care Ontario and the Ministry of Health. And they provide us with all our funding for the renal program. So I invited Mark here today to explain some of what the Ontario Renal Network actually does. So at the back we also have uh, Teddy who's here from the patient and Family Learning Center. She has a bunch of brochures and pamphlets and things if you're interested on your way out. And I believe that Mark also brought th some things from the Ontario Renal Network. So you're welcome to help yourself after the talk. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Mark Hebert. I didn't say your whole title and everything. I could say my whole title. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Hebert. Uh, so my title, official title with the ORN is the lead for First Nations Inuit and Métis Kidney Health with the Ontario Rail Network. But I also work, it's very long, I know, I saw that look in the back. <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> uh, we could just, it's a lead First Nations Inuit and Métis Kidney Health with the Ontario Rail Network. But I also work within the clinical programs team, which oversees all quality improvement management uh, a lot of the more innovative projects and also kind of overseeing how we come up with the ideas about what kind of great work is being done in programs like St. Mike's and uh, how we can leverage that across the province. So what I'll do is I'll give a brief overview of how we function as a kidney care system and how we work as a whole collective. Uh, I really enjoy the network part of the Ontario Renal Network because what that means to me is that with all of the programs that we have around People really collaborate. They really listen to each other. They really hear ideas from each other. And in all the different programs we have, all the way from Thunder Bay, all the way as far south as uh, Windsor, they work, they work together and come up with ideas that could be applicable and could help support patients so, and people like you. And so instead of you know, a great idea being contained somewhere in one program far away, they have a venue through us to share that and through us as part of clinical programs about how we can learn from it, adapt it, and fund it across the province. So I won't read all the text. I like to have very wordy slides that I don't read, but I know these will be circulated. Uh, who we are is a government agency that provides uh, leadership and strategic direction just to organize what's happening around the province. We develop standards and guidelines to help support and develop quality for kidney care. And we also run a lot of data. We do so much data work and run the information systems to take the data in, process it, and come up with uh, the information that is used to help you know, effectively use taxpayer funds to deliver kidney care. Uh, the way we guide this work is delivered by a core set of principles that we have in what's called the Ontario Renal Plan, or ORRP. We're on our second one for that. It'll just be over in about eight months, ten months. Ten months will be the end of uh, the second Ontario Renal Plan, and we'll be moving on to our third one that helps us tell us our guidelines and our principles about how we deliver this care. As Liz mentioned, we are under the umbrella of CCO and we are partnered with Cancer Care Ontario. So what that means is that, just like I mentioned about working with the 26 programs around the province, we too aren't trying to reinvent the wheel. So for us to do our own thing as a kidney care system wouldn't make a lot of sense because Cancer Care Ontario has been doing a lot of really great things for a really long time. And we wanted to learn from that and leverage a lot of the ways that they deliver policy and help quality improvement and have administration set up across the province. We wanted to learn from that and apply that to kidney care because it, it is a successful model. And there's a lot that we can learn from and a lot they can learn from us. It's a great collaboration. Uh, in the work I do in the, in the indigenous sphere, so First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Kidney Hall, uh, we learn a lot from their side of it. Uh, I like to joke that you know there's, well, there's two of us on my team and they have about 20 people on the same file on the cancer side. So maybe we can learn a little bit from what they do. Maybe we can borrow a bit of their labor once in a while. <laughs> uh, 
uh, we have a common goal with this, and the idea is that we create sustainable, high quality, the best quality health system for everyone in Ontario. Uh, we have our mission and vision up there, and I'll read it out. It's uh, that together, and I'll explain what together means in a bit, uh, we will improve the performance of our health systems by driving quality, accountability, innovation, and value. And it's working together to create the best health systems in the world. And so when I say together, it's, it's not just us as a government agency. I like to, whenever I go in a community, I like to make a point of saying, you know, it's not just a couple of us making ideas from the fourth story of an office building in Toronto. Uh, we have community organizations that work with us. We have programs like St. Michael's that help guide us and lead us. We have healthcare teams. We have the people in the back there that do fantastic work every day. And we learn from them. Uh, and right at the middle of everything we do, it's people the people that are on the under, other end of receiving the care. So here it says patients and families, but to us, we like to use the term person and people because that's what you are. And what it is, it's bringing everyone together for a common goal, a common purpose, and helping to really shape what a good person-centered care could look like. And again, that's not just us in a policy building trying to decide on that or you know, government uh, policy action. It's really guided by what really makes sense for the people receiving the care and the people delivering the care. As I mentioned, we have 26 regional programs around Ontario. And so I could probably list off all 26, but they're all on the map there for you. It's as far as uh, Thunder Bay up north and as far south as Windsor. Uh, these are the, what we use is what we call a hub and spoke model. So these programs essentially are the hubs for their area. Thunder Bay covers an area the size of France, for example. It's massive, but they also have spokes, and those spokes being the satellite facilities that offer their care. So those satellite facilities are in Kenora, Dryden, and Fort Francis, and that helps them extend their reach, but also make sure that they're bringing services to people rather than forcing people to have to come all the way to Thunder Bay. And so St. Michael's is one of our regional renal programs, and they're part of the region that is Toronto Central. Uh, they have satellite facilities as well, and also long-term care homes and uh, community outreach programs that provide that. Uh, what we have is a leadership structure that looks at having regional, lead regional directors from the administrative side, so we call them regional directors, but then also regional medical leads or kidney care doctors and nephrologists that help guide us and tell us what to do. Uh, we're a small team at the RN, but our the way that we have all the different uh, people out in the field and all the different programs telling us the way that we can develop better policy helps us make sure that it's delivered with a real world mindset. We're not just deciding you know, what we think is best. We hear right from the front line what it looks like. Uh, the numbers on there actually are, are a little bit out of date, but you're looking at this covering about 16, 17,000 people that are in advanced ki uh, kidney care, so the multi-care kidney clinic. It used to be called the pre-dialysis clinic, but we changed that and then some around uh, 12,000 people that are on dialysis. And so what this amounts to is about $650 million uh, as an annual cost for uh, d delivering dialysis care. And we want to make sure that we're spending that in a very responsible, sustainable way. Uh, this is, these are the three major goals of our strategic plan, the Ontario Renal Plan 2. And what these do is they tell us uh, they, we have different sub-goals beneath us, or different things that we wanted to achieve by the end of 2019, and we're really well on track to delivering on these, and we want to build on this for our third plan, but just for now, they are empowering patients, uh, integrating and coordinating care across the province, and improving access. So looking at that where people are receiving care, or how people are receiving care, and making sure that we improve that, that option so that people can receive the same options anywhere they are in Ontario. So I talked enough about myself and the work that we do. What, we want to talk, what I wanted to talk more about today is about person-centered care. So about the work that we do when it comes to people like you being actively involved in the care that you receive or in your family members, the care that they receive, and how we work to implement that in our structure as the Ontario Rail Network. It's a huge pillar of what we do. It's a huge pillar of what I do in my portfolio as well. And we make sure to have that across every aspect of care. Uh, so this is driven by what's in our second Ontario Renal Plan, and that's looking at how we make sure that we include patients and families in all the decisions we make as an agency, and then also work to embed them in the different, those 26 different programs across Ontario, make sure that they have a, pa a, a patient or family voice at the table. 
And one of our goals was to make sure that we empowered and supported people to be active in their care. So really just enabling that people have that opportunity to speak up, have that opportunity to be involved and active in uh, their care or the care that their family members receive, to make sure that they feel comfortable, safe, happy, they know that they have a voice. So there's two ways that we do this. On one hand, we have a community of patient family advisors. So these are people that volunteer on a bunch of our different initiatives. They sit on our, they sit on our board. They sit on our different, what we call priority panels, which oversee our portfolios. Uh, for example, with the uh, priority panel I have for my portfolio, which guides in then directs the actions I do, we do have a First Nations patient that sits and advises and definitely makes herself heard, and I'm all the more grateful for it. I want to hear from, I would rather have half my panel be patients, so we're hoping to increase that involvement. But that's an example of the kind of uh, involvement and volunteerism that we have. And that's all across, across our organization from the quality improvement work that we do, the more clinical aspects of things, then even looking at the funding side and the different projects that they have on that end, some of which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, they all have a voice at that table. We also have a broader table that sits, it's called our Patient and Family Advisory Council. And so they meet monthly, uh, three times a year in person and provide a lot of feedback and advice on a number of our initiatives across all of our priorities. So a big thing that, is, uh, that I make sure of is that at least once a year, hopefully twice a year, I go to them and say, here's the work that we're doing. Here's, what, you know, here's how much progress we've made on it. Does this make sense? Should we keep doing this? Should we change how we're doing this? You tell us, we'll listen, we'll embed that in our work. How can we involve more people? How can we involve a more diverse group of people in what we do, just to make sure that what we're doing makes sense for the people that are on the receiving end of it. And so this is a really fantastic group of people. I believe uh, most of you have met Mike McCormick. Uh, he chairs that group, and he's actively involved in it. So this uh, just kind of repeats what I said, but it's uh, just showing the different folks that a lot of these people are pictured are folks that are in our PFAC. So just some examples of some of the work that they have been involved in and what they do. Uh, so 10 of our staff members, we're a staff of around 50 right now, uh, have been hired with a patient and family advisor on the selection panel. So what that means is that person is there as an equal partner in the selection process, and they tell us, yes, you should hire this person. No, you shouldn't hire this person. I don't feel like they answered the questions appropriately. I don't feel like they would have that voice at the table. And so we make sure to have them, them there I had one uh, the aforementioned First Nations patient. She was on the table when I, we expanded uh, my, my team to two people, so big expansion. <laughs> uh, and she was such an important voice to have because half of the work I do is outreach in communities, and half the work, I, that work is so important to have the right people at the table for that. And so to, for have her to say, yes, I feel like this person would be the right person to go out with you to the communities and to do this on her own, said a lot. Uh, eight of our committees include at least one patient and family advisor. Uh, we've had 62 of our projects, activities, or ni initiatives since we started our second renal plan. So that's just in the past four and a bit years. I've had feedback from patient and family advisors. And right now, our third strategic plan, uh, the development is now being co-chaired by a patient and family advisor. And part of what they're doing as the development of this is they're going, they went across the province, met with patient groups, met with family groups, individuals, and said, like, what's important to you? What would you like to see change in the next five years of kidney care? And that's going directly into our plan. These were really fantastic sessions. There was so much input. And it really helped make sure that what we were doing and what directed our work really had that voice included. Uh, for our provincial table that we have, it began in October 4, 2015 as a forum for our patients, family members, and caregivers to advise on our work. And now we've expanded out. We have 14 people who have made that commitment to partner with us. Like I said, they meet three times a year and over the phone seven times a year. We give them a break over Christmas and the summer. Figure, you know, volunteers could always use a day off. And uh, they've support, supported and advised over 20 unique activities. Like I said, they're just an active participant in the work that I do, and I see just how important they are in all the portfolios that go and present on that table. I'm not going to read the whole list, but just some of the highlights of the different things. And I've got some, I brought a bunch of the handouts along with me, and they're just in the back there of some of the things that they've been involved in. Uh, so, a big one that I really, really enjoy is this uh, person centered care newsletter. So, there's two of them in the back there if you want to see. And so, what they are is it's, 
it's all written by people that are, are patient and family advisors or are on that committee. And what they do is they tell their perspective of embedding person-centered care across the province. This one, the front page, has, it talks about the peer support in the north. So looking at the, an individual that's, he was in uh, Thunder Bay, talking about how he's developed a peer support group in his area and how he's learned from others and how they can Im embed it in their, their area too. It talks about the Transplant Ambassador Program, which was a program set up so that people that are interested in donating or people that are interested in receiving a kidney could help work to, talk to others that have been through that same experience and learn from each other. And there's also talk about the uh, peer support programs that are offered through the Kidney Foundation of Canada, which sets up a lot of really great frameworks about how to set up a peer support program. If anyone's interested in being involved in anything like this, uh, at the very bottom there is interest, and in, uh, sorry that it's a little small, but you'll see if you pick it up. At the very bottom it does list an email address, and uh, you can always reach out to them, and they're, it's, they, it's a team that works in the same cubicle area as me. I know they're always happy to hear from people and always happy to hear how others can be involved. Uh, other areas where they've been involved too, uh, no one is the Home Hemodialysis Utility Grant. So this was a program that was set up by the Ontario Renal Network. And the idea was that they recognized that people that go on home hemodialysis incur a higher cost for water, higher cost for electricity, and these are costs that people that receive dialysis in hospital don't have to incur. So we created a grant program to help offset or cover, and maybe possibly entirely cover the cost of these extra services and extra utilities for people. And to help advise on this, we involve people that are on home hemodialysis because they've lived that experience. They know what it's like. They know that hardship. And it helped build our case and help build what's a more sustainable, more appropriate program to deliver to people across Ontario. Uh, one of the big highlights for me is actually just a couple weeks ago. It was our conference that we called Kidney Talks. So what this was was a con two-day conference just in Mississauga where we had a couple keynote speakers, but really just a bunch of different, uh, we call them sub-plenaries, but you know, smaller workshops dedicated to different focus areas. And what stood out to me was that every single one of the panels presenting had at least one person, one patient or one family member, and sometimes multiple, sometimes it was entirely patients or family members presenting. And the idea was that that voice is just on par, it's equal to providers, it's equal to government agents, it's equal to nephrologists, it's equal to any of these people, and in my, vo in my opinion, it's higher. It's more important than that because it's that lived experience and they were there to really speak their mind and say what had to be said about the subject matter. I was really thrilled that I had uh, Mary uh, Bocage, who's uh, from Nipissing First Nations, speak on my panel. And honestly, like she just had the f room completely silent because she told her story. She told about her experience about receiving care all up until receiving a transplant and all the things that she experienced as a First Nations woman going through that jurisdictional challenge of uh, working with both the Manitoba government, the Ontario government, and also the federal government just to get access to a kidney that someone said that she, was, she could have. And so having that perspective and having that input was so important, and we really wanted to highlight that. And so to highlight a lot of the voices that we have from our patient and family advisors, we did create a video series and uh, what these are is just an idea of providing uh, the perspective of people that have, had, that have lived with kidney disease, looking at their experience and really telling their story. Because, you know, I, th I think a story t says so much. It says so much more than a policy document or anything like that. That can be in the background, but to me it's so important that we hear the story of the people receiving that care. And so we have so many of these videos available. Uh, so we do have these postcards up. If anyone is interested in listening to some of the stories, uh, you can see all the YouTube links. Uh, or sorry, it does link you to our website that has all the videos hosted. And happy to have you watch them and uh, tell us what you think. And we're also always happy to hear more stories and film them and host them on there. I think I've been talking for long enough, so I'm more than happy to hear any questions or any comments or anything anyone has to say. In the back. I have a question with regards to the data. Yes. You, you said you collect all kinds of data. What is that data? What, what, what is the data that you collect? Uh, so for the data that we collect, oh, the question was what, is it, what are the kinds of data we collect and what does it do? And so the kind of data that we collect is really at every point that someone accesses care. And so the idea is that you record 
about the person. You know, you look at their clinical variables, you look at information about the person, but then also about their experience receiving care. So we have what's called the tracker, which looks at basically, you know, their experience on looking at different options for dialysis access, whether it's a catheter, graft, fistula, or PD catheter, uh, what kind of options they have, what kind of education they receive. And the idea being that we collect this data to learn more about the person at their discretion, of course, and understand how we can better support people. So it's really it's a combination of looking descriptive information about the person, but then also the story of the person receiving care, and we find out how we can provide better care based on that. The question was how many people have heard of us, and I'm not offended to understand that not many of you have, and that's totally okay. Uh, what we actually have been doing is we're working on revamping our website and our public-facing materials because we recognize what we have up there is kind of daunting, kind of honestly kind of boring, not really interesting information to people that do receive care. So putting more information on there that's more relevant to you and more interesting and more, uh, more about this idea of having people be empowered and informed to access their care rather than just information about you know, data and statistics, which will also be on there. But that's more information that is more interesting to us. We already have. If, uh, if anyone's interested in more information about the ORN, we'd also be happy to share that at any time. Uh, so the Patient and Family Learning Center is just down the hall on your right-hand side, open from 9 to 2, Monday to Friday. Uh, we are there 100% to support patients and families. That's what we do. Um, so we're here to help you find any information on the ORN site if you're looking for information, if you're looking for contact numbers in terms of getting uh, in contact with their patient uh, advisory councils, by all means, we'll help you through that. Uh, we also have a website that's dedicated to the patients and families here at St. Michael's in the renal program, and we're more than happy to show you that. There are links out to the ORN on that, and hopefully after I talk to Mark, there'll be more links uh, out uh, to that as well. Um, but just like everything else, if there's anything that you don't see that you want to see, either in terms of what we bring here every day or every time we come or on the website itself, by all means, let us know and we'll make sure that it gets there. <clears throat> okay. Back to you, Mark. Liz in the back. Mark, on the bottom of the newsletter, there's a website to get contact if you want to get involved. There isn't a phone number if you want to get involved. Not everybody's yep. computer friendly. So the question was uh, whether, if there is a phone number to get involved, and I'm happy to say there is, so I can give that to Liz. Uh, we, what we do is we have a central CCO phone line and the person will direct that appropriately. Uh, if there are general questions about the ORN or about getting involved, the person who sits right behind me is the one that's on the receiving end of all those. All those phone uh, lines get directed to him. That same person is the person who is responsible for running that patient and family advisory committee and can answer any, any questions or direct you to anything, anywhere that you want within us. We're, since we have an open door policy and we're happy to answer any questions. So I'll give that to Liz and we can distribute that afterwards. We actually have a surprise visitor this afternoon. Wait, uh, what's the Doug Ford? No. <laughs> it's not Doug Ford. No. <laughs> not even Doug Ford's cousin. <laughs> it's Michael McCormick, who happens to be the chair of the Patient and Family Advisory Council at the Ontario Renal Network. Michael is one of the home hemodialysis patients here in the St. Michael's program. Michael thought he might get up here to the microphone and maybe encourage some people to get involved in the Patient and Family Advisory Council at the Ontario Renal Network. If that's all right with you, Mark, for just a moment. By all means. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, having not seen Mark's presentation, I apologize if... Uh, did you touch on any PFAC stuff? I did. 
Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, without being too repetitive, so the uh, the Patient and Family Advisory Council at the uh, at the ORN. Okay, if I use ORN, everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, so the uh, the Patient and Family Advisory Council or PFAC uh, came together. So the the renal network's primary uh, uh, goal is to deliver renal services like dialysis. Uh, and post-transplant care and pre-dialysis care. Uh, and they put together a, a five-year plan every five years. And so the last plan was put together in 20, I guess, 15, 14, 2014, I think. Um, and part of that plan uh, was to form a, a patient and family advisory council. And the idea was that the renal network in delivering services for patients wanted to make sure that patients had a say in all the things they do. Uh, so the, they put together, as part of building that five-year plan, there were a bunch of patients involved, including myself, uh, and my name was put forward by, um, I don't know if any of you remember Jill Campbell, who was the uh, program director here prior to Jonathan, but uh, Jill put my name forward as someone that had been around the renal system for a long time and thought this guy might be able to give some uh, give some experience about what it's like to be on dialysis and to get a transplant and uh, just generally be in St. Mike's Hospital. And so I, uh, I gave my input for the plan and out of that plan, the, peop the uh, Mark and his colleagues asked me to be part of the uh, Patient and Family Advisory Council. Uh, so we've been together uh, since uh, November of 2015. Uh, we're 14 mighty, but uh, a strong but mighty group from all over the province. We have uh, the feistiest lady you'd ever meet, I think, uh, from Thunder Bay. Uh, her name's Marcia. Always has something to say. She's about this tall, and she's got a voice of someone that's 10 feet tall. Um, we have a, a very, um, how would you describe Harry? He's, uh, he's, he's um, doesn't say very much. But when he does, man, you listen because he, he, he just thinks and thinks and thinks and when he's got a properly formed thought in his head, he comes out with it. Um, we have uh, members from Windsor, members from Ottawa, uh, people on, uh, with transplants, people with, uh, that are on uh, dialysis, people on PD. Uh, we have family members. We have a woman whose husband passed away uh, in 2013 and her way of kind of honoring his memory was to uh, to donate her time so she uh, provides the perspective of someone who's uh, who's um, uh, journey with uh, kidney disease is towards the end so she provides some really valuable insight uh, because a lot of people are uh, are you know, just dialysis or transplant didn't work for them or they were, they have multiple other things wrong with them. Um, wonderful woman, she's, uh, she's a really great addition to our, our PFAC. Um, so we, uh, we meet uh, 10 times a year. We just, when we had our first meeting, we thought the first thing we have to do is figure out when to meet and how to meet. So we do uh, seven uh, calls by teleconference, which isn't the best thing. Uh, and then we managed to get funding to, uh, to bring everyone together into, uh, into one room. So we meet uh, at one of the hotels over uh, near University Avenue for a full day of meetings uh, three times a year. And those are by far and away the best meetings because we, you know, these are people that we talk to on the phone but we never see. We don't know anything about them, about their families, about their lives, like what their, their path to get to where they are. So we, uh, yeah, we have a really great time. We've managed to do some, uh, some social events. We're, uh, we're going to a Blue Jays game uh, in, in July because the people that are not from Toronto think that the Blue Jays are great. It hasn't got out to them that they're not very good. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great experience. And you know, we've, um, I really feel like we've, uh, we've managed to do some, uh, some good in terms of uh, the renal system planning. So, um, I don't. Did you talk about the the HUG program? You did. Okay. So the home utility grant program was one of the things that uh, one of our members proposed that if uh, if we wanted more people considering home dialysis, we should take down some of the financial barriers. And 
man, from the day we proposed that till the day it got approved, uh, because as you probably all know, since you were talking about Doug Ford, the government doesn't like to give you money. So uh, to get a program approved where you're getting reimbursed uh, to do a medical treatment at home is across the, the medical system unique. And uh, obviously the government had to consider it very carefully, but they decided that uh, the value from the government's point of view, which is saving money, uh, is worth the investment of uh, reimbursing people. But it also opens the door for us to look at other things that uh, renal patients are uh, have to carry the cost for to go back and say, okay, you proved that, maybe we can get something else too. So, uh, so we always keep that kind of stuff uh, on our agenda. Um, we're, we're in the middle right now of trying to network all of the, um, all of the programs in Ontario. So there are uh, so 26 programs like St. Mike's uh, that ha then have satellite uh, programs. So uh, there's 26 primary programs and most of them now have some form of patient and family advisory council. So uh, by the end of this year, uh, we're hoping to network all of the patient and family advisory councils together so that uh, we can share ideas because uh, there's some really great things going on in all programs, in the, in the programs here at St. Mike's and at programs elsewhere. And, and the way we find out about them, because normally we just, we only interact with people in our own programs. So uh, by networking the, the patient and family advisory councils together, we can, uh, we can strive to get the best practices from all the programs uh, and bring them together and, and try to make use of them in, in, in our own programs. So basically trying to bring the bar up for, for all of the programs. Um, what else do we have going on? Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. We went through a, like an exercise at the beginning of this year where we, uh, we, just, uh, we all had sticky notes and we just started writing down ideas of how we think this, the, um, the renal system could be better, and we we uh, we piled them all together. Our next uh, in-person meeting, the one that's tied to the Blue Jays game, or I should probably reference that the other way. The Blue Jays game is tied to the meeting. Um, we're gonna we're gonna focus on what uh, what things the renal network can uh, uh, can actually focus on. So not everything is under their responsibility, but uh, we will certainly try and get as many of the ideas. Uh, uh, put forth so that we can uh, we can make the the renal program uh, the renal programs in in Ontario better. So I didn't prepare anything, so I guess I'll I'll leave it at that. Does anyone have any questions about the, our patient and family advisory council? Anyone want to know how to get involved, either locally or at the provincial level? Yeah. Yeah, I, my my personal experience has been um, in in getting involved with volunteering is that um, like this is a tough disease. This is, this affects us all day, every day, and um, it to me it's been really uh, I don't know what the right word is empowering or but it, it's really um, it's really helped me uh, working with other people that are going through the same thing or worse in fact. Um, I mean, there, there's people on the, uh, there's one gentleman from uh, somewhere up north, Sault Ste. Marie, I think, and his whole family has kidney disease. Him and his brother, his dad passed away from kidney disease. They have polycystic or something like that. And, um, and they, like, I look at him and I think, like, his kids now are getting tested because he didn't know he had, um, he didn't know he had PKD 
uh, till he had kids, and now his kids want to know before they have kids. So it's, you know, and you, you look at someone like him and he's there and he's like, he chairs the Patient and Family Advisory Council in, in Sault Ste. Marie. He makes time to sit on the, the, provincial, uh, um, the provincial council. And, and I look at that guy and I think, man, if that guy can find time, I can find time. Like, and, and it really, you know, it helps me, not that I wanna say like, I, I, I find strength in being better off than him, but hearing his story helps me realize that I'm not in this by myself. And, and it makes me feel like putting my time in is worthwhile because there might be someone that says, hey, if that guy can do it, then I can do it too. So it, it, it does create that sense of community uh, of getting in a room with other people and, and sharing your experiences and, and you know, feeling better about your, uh, about your situation. Yeah, and, and I, I wanted to really highlight um, the, um, the woman that's on our, our Patient and Family Advisory Council whose husband uh, was the patient, but I mean, she, she dove into this head first. Like she wanted to know everything there was to know because you know, you're bringing, it's in your house. Like you're, you're all dealing with it. The whole family's dealing with it, right? So um, I think it's, it's it's great to, that you, as a, as a care provider, uh, which I think is your title. <laughs> I know so many things. Yeah. Since I know this two years. Yeah. Every time when, they, when I get a message, I come always. Yeah. Sometimes I don't care when I lose my hours. Because life is more important than the money, you know? Yeah. So I want to say, anytime when I get a calm and they send me paper, and I say, yes, I put my house there. Because I want to learn. I learned so many things now. Yeah. yeah, and I know for me, like uh, when I'm going to important appointments or whatever, if my if my wife comes with me, we've got two sets of ears. So, you know, we, you know, we both hear it, and then we can have a discussion about it after. Yes. Like, you know, what did this mean, or what should we do in this case, or whatever. Like, it, it really helps to have someone that sort of they may not have the disease, but if they understand sort of what you're going through, then it uh, it certainly helps. Any other questions? Uh, one question I have. Sure. So, let's say this, uh, he had to, when he planned to go to the dialysis, he you know, even made plan uh, at home. But in the middle of the, when you go to dialysis, we can change and go to the hospital, we can do. Maybe we, not, that we can take it home. Maybe next month we want to go to the hospital, we can do change. Oh, so if you if you choose to go on home dialysis, do you have the option to come into the hospital for a break? Yeah. I'll leave that to Mina. I guess I think that is allowed. Yes. Is it? Of course. <laughs> it's, it's, yes. yes. You can change. There are two types of dialysis, and if you choose one, and you think at that point it's the right option for you, and then down the road you realize no, maybe that's not working for you, then they, you can definitely switch to. And was your question more about taking a break or like a permanent switch back and forth? No, uh, not the break. Like a Just if you decide exactly. to try home dialysis and then you, it's not for you, break. yeah, of course you can switch back. But we cannot take a break, no? Sure you can. <laughs> like the unit, so I have, I mean, I haven't done it often, but I, the, the home dialysis unit, there are machines there and when they can schedule you, they, like I've come in, uh, just like things weren't going well at home and I've come in and taken a day off work and come in and got my dialysis done. So it's just a mental break. Maybe I'm not supposed to be advertising that. But. <laughs> <laughs> Something I want to make quite clear is that when people make a decision about which type of dialysis they want, it, doesn't, it speaks to your question. It doesn't mean that you have to stay on that dialysis forever, permanently, unless there's a medical reason that you can't go from one to the other. But certainly there are people that will start on peritoneal dialysis at home and then decide, this isn't for me, 
I want to do it at the hospital. Or there's patients that start in the hospital on in-center hemodialysis and then decide, I don't want to come to the hospital three times a week, I want to try it at home. And if they can't do peritoneal, then they can try hemo. And, and we have other options in the province now where there's um, home hemo-assisted dialysis at home, where there are PSW workers that are able to come to your home and help you do your dialysis, your hemodialysis at home. So a lot of things have changed. I've been in nephrology or kidney kidneys for 35 years now. And a lot of things that people would ask me 35 years ago are coming, are coming to fruition now. They're actually starting to happen. Many years ago, people would say to me, can you, come, can you, can you send someone to my house to do dialysis? And I'd say, no, it's not possible. But now it is. So the Ontario Renal Network has helped with a lot of that. Patients like Michael that have been on hemodialysis for 30 years have helped with a lot of that. He's had a voice. He's had a voice on behalf of all of you and has advocated on behalf of all of you and the patients that are in this province. But, but that voice has been heard and the renal network is trying to change things for us. Let's face it, in a country where you know, the federal government and the provincial government are all providing money, things move slowly. But the more, the more we get involved, the more we speak up, which, you know, as Canadians, we tend to be a little bit complacent about things and not really have that voice. So someone like Michael and the others that are on the Patient and Family Advisory Council with the ministry and the ministry taking that voice higher up, things do get done, albeit slowly sometimes, but your voice does get heard. So getting involved does make a difference. That's my little speech for this afternoon. Go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> Hi, uh, Michael? Okay, yes. back to you. Uh, thank you. You said you, you were on dialysis for 30 years. Yep. How do you feel now as opposed to 20 years ago, 25 years ago? 20 years older. <laughs> um, a, a tough. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question was how, um, uh, seeing that I've been on dialysis for thirty years, how do I feel today compared to twenty years ago? Um, so the uh, it's funny. So I, I I struggle with this because I look in the mirror and I see my twenty five year old self, and then I see a picture of my twenty five year old self, and I. I think that's some uh, child that I don't know about or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm 50 years old. I have 50-year-old aches and pains that are probably 50-year-old aches and pains and nothing to do with dialysis. Um, I've had a lot of surgeries. Um, uh, dialysis uh, and kidney disease takes its toll on your body, so uh, some of the things are associated with that. But I mean. I still, I still go to the gym, I still play sports. I, I mean, I, I believe personally that uh, any little bit you can do to help yourself uh, in terms of uh, just living well, like living healthy, uh, doing exercise, whether that's walking around the block or going to the gym or playing soccer, whatever you can do, like uh, any little bit of exercise to keep your lungs working, keep your heart moving, keeping your blood circulating will help you in the long run because at the, at the end of the day, you're, this disease is working against you, so you have to do something to fight back. So little things like uh, eating healthy and, and uh, general fitness have helped me, I think. So I, I would say that the, so uh, to, to, um, to Liz's point, so my, my dialysis history, so I, I started as an in-center patient in St. Mike's. Uh, I did self-care dialysis in St. Mike's. I had a, a little self-care unit at one point. Um, so I, like, I cannulated, I set up my machine, I, I did my treatments, but the machine was here. Uh, and then um, I wanted a little more freedom, so then I went home and I did uh, home, uh, what's called home conventional dialysis. So I would go to work, 
I would come home, I would dialyze from like six o'clock till 10 o'clock, and then I'd go to sleep and get up and repeat each day. Um, but in the end, um, like that didn't offer me the balance of how much time I was spending with my medical care and how much time I was spending living life. And so I wanted to free up my evenings, which is what my decision process was to do home nocturnal hemodialysis, which meant uh, now my evenings are all free uh, and I can um, do whatever I want. I, I, I mean, one of the main reasons I wanted to do that was I started playing uh, the winter sport of curling, if you know it. Um, I started playing quite competitively, which required me to practice and be available in the evenings mm -hmm. and on the weekends. Uh, to play with my team and so I needed more free time to do that and so sleeping and dialyzing at the same time is the ultimate uh, you know using <laughs> double using your time I guess um, but to your question back to your question I feel like so I spent uh, I think about seven years of in center here uh, another four years uh, uh, I went to university in Waterloo. So all in all, I think I did about 11 or 12 years of in-center dialysis. And I feel like I aged a lot more in that time when I was doing the short dialysis than in the time that I've spent doing nocturnal dialysis where you're on the machine longer, the pump speed is run slower. So it's a lot more gentle on the body. You're not taking as much fluid off uh, per hour. So like most, I don't know if, how many of you are on dialysis, but like most nights I'm not taking any more than uh, like somewhere between 100 and 200 cc's an hour. So it's very gentle on the body. So I feel like uh, even though those were the last 15 years of my life on nocturnal, I feel like I've, I've aged the least in my, my time on dialysis. Like I feel like I have less uh, bad days. How old do you have to be? A transplant, you mean? Oh, what's the age cutoff? Oh, the upper age? The age, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if there is an upper age. When they had transplant, was 80 years old. But age is a number. They have to see how healthy you are. If you go under the surgery and have the transplant. It's a one to transplant. What's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, is that what they said? I think, again, it, it just sort of... Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just, the other thing that just, uh, you know, I, I, uh, Liz made a point of me being on dialysis for 30 years. Uh, I was in uh, Montreal for uh, work last week and the nurse that was taking care of me at the Montreal General, uh, she was asking me um, how long I'd been on dialysis, and I said 30 years, and I, I think I must have said it like, uh, you know, 30 years, I'm kind of proud of it. Like, I, I've really survived. I kind of fought the system and won. And she said, the guy two seats over you, from you, has been on for 49 years. He, he just, as of June 2018, just was um, announced as the Guinness uh, world record holder for longest uh, consecutive on dialysis. He was 11 years old when he started dialysis and he's been on dialysis 49 straight years since. And like he's not, no sign of slowing down either. He, he, uh, he stopped working, he's 60, he stopped working at 55 because he's like, I think I've done a good job. So, so yeah, so, what, so then I look at that guy and I'm like, wow, that's amazing, like 49 years. Like, so, yeah, there's always an incredible story out there. Um, yes? Did you think of a kidney transplant? Yeah, so my transplant history, and I, 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 I was hoping no one would ask, because my transplant history is not very positive. Um, so I will tell the story, but please, it's my story, so don't take anything from it uh, for yourself. So um, the type of kidney disease I had. So when I was 18 years old, I was perfectly healthy on Friday. I had 100% kidney failure on Sunday. Um, and that was just the nature of the kidney disease that I had, that it's, it's called FSGS. Um, and it, on top of that, it's called acute or aggressive FSGS. 
and so the the disease itself is circulating in my in my uh, body somewhere. Um, so the transplants I got, the first one was from my dad uh, in 1988, and the second one was from a cousin in 1994. And in both cases, the FSGS went into the transplanted kidneys when I was still on the OR table. So I, was, I basically went straight back to dialysis like the next day after the transplant. So um, it's not a normal case, um, so that's why I don't really like uh, saying it. I do, uh, like I do run into Dr. Zaltzman if, you, if you're around the transplant world at all. Uh, Dr. Zaltzman's the uh, head transplant nephrologist here at, uh, at St. Mike's. And I keep asking him, like, is there anything new? Because, you know, dialysis isn't going to work forever, so it would be nice to maybe get a successful transplant. So is there any research that's been done? And the answer has been no, 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 no. So. Um, and part of it is, is that because the, the disease and the way the disease affected me is fairly rare, it's hard to research because there's not that many people to research uh, to see what might work or might not work. So I'm sure there are people that have ideas, but to be able to do proper research, you need a, a, a certain number of people to be able to research. So, yeah, so I, I, I'm sorry I have to, to, it's not a great story, but I mean, it's, it's my reality. So it, it just means that uh, when that second transplant didn't work, uh, it kind of mentally, I said, okay, dialysis is the only way to go, so I better find a way to make this work. That was kind of my, uh, what kind of kept me mentally tough to, because uh, there's some, there's lots of days on dialysis, you, uh, you just think, man, I've had enough, and then, you find a way to get up and keep going the next day, right? Yeah. I don't like link. Uh, I meant uh, your coworker mentioned the word volunteer. Yes. So it pricked up my ears. That's all I know. Uh, are you guys here to tell us about the volunteer? <laughs> Is that your why you're here? <laughs> uh, yeah. Part of why I was here was to talk about the. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, so part of why I was here was just to talk about the uh, provincial uh, family and advisor, patient and family advisory committee, but uh, then also locally, patient and family advisors, people that have had experience with kidney disease, how they can get involved like Mike is, and just uh, help us as a government agency make better decisions and better policy related to kidney disease. So if you will. So the volunteers aren't like uh, ordinary people, they're like professional no. No, no. These are people, ordinary people that have either been direct, uh, like dialysis patients or transplant recipients, or people that are family members of them. Well, what do I do to uh, get involved? We, get to, we have a. Uh, so we have a lot of information in the back of our newsletters. If you look in the bottom corner there, it has it does have an email address, but then we'll also be sharing out a phone number about that too. So happy to hear from you. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure, Mark, if you went into this before. So the ORN actually has two uh, levels of engagement. So the Patient and Family Advisory Council is meant to be a small group of people that advise on the activities of the ORN. But there's also another larger group of people called just Patient and Family Advisors. So not, they don't have to sit on that council. They don't have to go to 10 boring meetings a year but they get involved in um, smaller initiatives. So um, I sit on an, on an initiative called uh, Home First, which is looking at ways to get uh, more people interested in home dialysis. Um, there's a, um, what other priority panels? Oh. <laughs> oh, you got them up there, okay. Yeah, so these are all the, the various uh, panels that uh, patient and family advisors have uh, got involved in. So uh, there's lots of ways to get involved with the ORN. Um, and I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say this. I actually don't know what PFACs we have here at St. Mike's, but I know there's definitely a hospital PFAC, and then there's an in-center PFAC, and then I know Liz has been trying very hard, and when I find time, I'm gonna help her make it happen, a uh, home uh, a home patient, uh, patient and family advisory council. So, there's also one for transplant now, Michael. Yes, okay. Um, the other way, I don't know, is anyone in here um, a transplant patient? Are there any transplant patients in here, donors or recipients? No? Okay. 
Um, there is a, if, uh, if you do know anyone, uh, there is a program that is partially sponsored by the ORN uh, called the Transplant Ambassador Program. Yep. Oh, you, taught, you spoke about this? Briefly, yeah. <laughs> you can tell we're singing from the same song sheet here. Um, so the Transplant Ambassador Program is basically uh, like peer support. So um, there are people that will be around uh, the pre-dialysis clinics, um, I don't know where else they would be here at St. Mike's specifically, but we'll talk to you about their experience of either uh, receiving a kidney or donating a kidney, and that will uh, maybe help someone that's kind of struggling with the decision if they hear someone uh, that's had a very positive experience, unlike mine, but uh, someone that's had a positive experience may help you uh, uh, clarify your thoughts on whether transplant is something that's right for you. So lots of ways to get involved, for sure. Could you explain saying my veins? Is that something that uh, yeah. we can do to correct our veins? The yeah, so um, I don't know if anyone's got any. I'm just looking. So uh, the ORN started a program four years ago or so um, that is uh, maybe more than four. More than four? Okay. Liz is giving me the more, more than four years ago. Uh, so you'll see people around wearing little purple bracelets. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a public education campaign. You'll see posters around. Uh, I know there's one in the, on the information board outside the, um, the north uh, dialysis unit. Uh, and basically, the idea is when you are um, new to uh, dialysis or new to hemodialysis, uh, the idea is to uh, limit how much blood work and blood pressures you get done on one arm so that it, it literally saves your veins so when they go in to make a fistula, your veins are in better shape so that when they do the actual surgery, the chance of your, uh, your fistula maturing into uh, um, into a working fistula is, is much better. So, and, and that goes for, so a lot of people get, I mean, for any patient, it's, you're, you're the one that's gonna be sticking your arm out for blood work, so whether it's the nurses in the dialysis unit or at the blood lab on the third floor or if you go to life labs outside the hospital, it's really up to you as the patient or the family member to remind the person which arm is the one that you're saving and the one, and which arm you're making available for uh, blood pressures and blood work. But it, it's, uh, it's shown to be really increase the uh, success of, of uh, fistula creations. And I, sorry, I wanted to address your other comment about the volunteers. I, my only experience is I've been a patient for a long time. My, like I work at the stock exchange. I have no medical background. I have like all this, all my uh, talking about Kidney disease is just stuff that I've learned on the job, as it were. Um, so, and the the people on the on the patient and family advisory council range. There's a young man that's just graduating from university, just started dialysis last year. To uh, that woman I talked about in um, up in Thunder Bay has been retired for 15 years and has just poured her her life into volunteer work kidney and otherwise. She just is a very community-minded uh, person and just, and just wanted to get involved. So there's, you know, there's, um, there's lots of ways and you really, other than having the experience of being involved in the, um, in the uh, uh, CKD world, the kidney world, then um, that's all the experience you need. You'd like me to promo the kidney walk. Well. <laughs> I will need a card then. <laughs> Why not? Yes. And so, is there a date on here? I don't see when it is. So, September 22nd. So, uh, kidney walk is a. Uh, a function of the Kidney Foundation, which is another agency uh, separate from the Ontario Renal Network that uh, raises money uh, primarily for uh, research, but also for some patient services. Um, 
And one of the ways they do uh, raise money is with the Kidney Walk annually. I know St. Mike's, uh, headed by Carmen, I think you are the, there's a team, but I, I, know, I think Carmen's the, the driver, uh, <laughs> uh, puts a St. Mike's team together. So I think you guys, I've never actually done it. I'm, I should. <laughs> um, but the St. Mike's team uh, at least starts together. I don't know if everyone walks at the same speed, but uh, um, the, uh, it's, a great, it's a great event, I've heard. My wife did uh, the Alberta version of this uh, called the Kidney March, I think it is. Uh, theirs is much harder. This is a 5K walk, I believe. Uh, she did 100K over three days or something like that. But uh, whatever you can do to get involved, uh, like I said, I, uh, when I was answering that question before, I think if you get involved in the community, it really, my experience has been that it's really helped me uh, live with kidney disease. Like, just learn from other people's experiences, take little pieces from here and there, and, and then take control of your, uh, your treatment and, and make the best of it. Did you talk about thin? Briefly? Briefly? I want to. I, I think I want to just make one other mention. And uh, Mark maybe didn't highlight this. One of Mark's, our Mark's main role at the ORN, is the uh, First Nations Inuit and Métis portfolio. And um, a lot of you may not know, but uh, uh, First Nations Inuit and Métis people in Canada are are impacted by kidney disease more proportionately than the rest of the population. And uh, Mark's role is uh, supremely important in uh, getting services. Like we, we almost take for granted what we have available to us in downtown Toronto. Like imagine if you had to fly three hours to get to your doctor. Or uh, you know, if you wanted to get a transplant, you had to get up and move for six months to another city. That's what the life is like for a lot of these people. So a lot of the work we do uh, at the ORN is also to, uh, to look at people, not only First Nations Inuit and Métis, but people that are, are remote. Ontario is a massive province, and a lot of it is not like downtown Toronto. In fact, most of it's not like downtown Toronto. So um, there's a lot of really good work uh, being done by the ORN and others uh, to make sure that equality is a main focus uh, for the delivery of renal care and the other parts of the, uh, the medical system as well. So I just, Mark I think is a, a uh, modest guy, he might not have pointed out, but it's a very, very important uh, role. And uh, we, even though we're in Toronto and we have the benefit of great institutions like St. Mike's, we have to keep an eye out for our other uh, fellow Ontarians that don't have the, uh, the same uh, the same facilities at our fingertips. Yes? Um, is that because of genetics or uh, environment? I'm going to hand that over to you. Uh, so the question was whether the increased uh, prevalence of kidney disease among Indigenous people was because of genetics or environment. Uh, mostly it's because of an environment. And the idea being that in a lot of the communities, they don't have access to all the other services. Like Mike mentioned, you know, and when you're in the community, like I was up in Attawapiskat in Moose Factory last week, they're staffed for 12 primary care physicians and they currently have four. And so what that means is a lot of things like primary care, prevention of disease, looking at diseases like diabetes, things that you, know, through, you can manage through lifestyle isn't addressed early on. And so you have those downstream impacts so much more because you don't have access to that care and that equity isn't there. There is considered to be a very, very small genetic factor in place, but it's nothing compared to the impact of what's that access to care and how that impacts people's lifestyles. It's also uh, the impact, if you think about it, the loss of that traditional lifestyle. A lot of people are so used to living off the land, and when you live somewhere that far up and don't have access to healthy, nutritious foods, and you've lost that uh, ability to live off the land, living in a community like that, it's, uh, it's unfortunately a, cause of a lot of major lifestyle diseases like the diabetes and hypertension which cause two-thirds of all kidney disease. Is that a, what do they call it up there, they're, they're digging up all the oil on shale, uh, including the end result, they're, they're putting the other, they're putting polluted water in, into other parts of the uh, territory. Is that part of the, um, the whole thing, people are drinking bad water or 
planting, planting, eating food from bad uh, soil? I don't know about the direct impact of kidney disease, but I can tell you that absolutely there was a huge water crisis in the north, and that just impacts people's overall health, and their access to clean, healthy water is just a major detractor to the health. The apple basket tar sands, apparently they have to, some part of the process is taking clean water, using it to clean the tar, to make a steam, and then the end result is that all that uh, bad stuff is poured into uh, some place upstream from all the where the people live, and so then they drink it and they use it for growing crops and crops and, you know, and, and so they're ingesting all kinds of really yeah. bad heavy 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 metals. I guess it is. Eh? A lot of communities on Ontario across Canada have been impacted by that, and it's it's terrible. And there's a, there is work underway to address it, but I mean, it, it's going to be a major uphill battle to address that, and there's no telling what that impact could be in the future. I won't get too much on my soapbox about that, but yeah. I agree with you 100%. Uh, a lot of the work what we do is really looking at how we can make sure that, like when we connect with communities, and develop, like part of my role is developing relationships with communities, is making sure they have access to other branches of government too. So making sure that they have a seat at the table for that. You know. And hopefully that, you know, kidney disease as part of the government health, uh, the Ministry of Health is quite small. But the idea being that because we are small, we can be quite agile and quite nimble. We can respond to things a lot faster. I'm really hoping that by making some solutions that work better for our communities in the north, we can set an example and really serve as like how we can show that you can make a difference. Like if I can get people on home hemodialysis in, you know, Big Trout Lake, 600 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, maybe we can get some more innovative services up there and help those people out a lot better. But again, sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox about that. <laughs> well, it's important. It's very yeah. important. A lot of uh, that I see that a lot on CBC on uh, Fifth Estate or whatever you call it. Uh, a lot of kidney disease in the uh, community because of all these chemicals that they're ingesting. So I fully agree here on TV is the same thing that you're talking about. Uh, kind of a, to me, it's, it's very important. Just yeah. as important as the people down here in Toronto. <laughs> yeah. We all have challenges, but yeah, that's a different but very, very important one up in the north. And something that we really want to, as it's on our third Ontario renal plan, is going to be looking directly at challenges facing northern communities broad, broader, like not just indigenous people, but then also looking at specific challenges for communities because they have to deal with so much more living on some of their reserves and not having that control over their lands the way they should. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? We're happy to hear it or I'll be around as the, oh, we have one other. Uh, so the question is, uh, does NIHB cover for kidney care supplies? And for those of you that don't know, NIHB is uh, the f a federal program that provides, uh, it's called non-insured health benefits, uh, provides coverage for First Nations and Inuit people. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the ORN does. We cover all those supplies. And so that's, we do that completely agnostic of NIHB coverage or not. The idea is that people have that coverage first and then we work on the back end. We're also working on how we directly with NIHB on how we can enhance more kidney care supports for people. So looking at stuff like uh, home dialysis supplies, how we can enhance whether they have all those additional supports, because I know there's a lot of personal purchase you need to make to set up a home dialysis at home. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the uh, transplant um, donor and recipient. Mm -hmm. Is there a list that you have specifically for Um, are you, are you so talking about the, the, like to actually receive a transplant? Yeah, to, if you don't have a, a donor, yeah. like a family donor. Oh, okay. So, uh, so there, uh, do you want to? Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, is there a list for the transplant recipients? And I believe the case is that if you are a candidate for transplant, uh, that list is maintained by the Trillium Gift of Life Network, and they manage all that. Uh, it's called the Trillium Gift of Life Network. Okay. 
So actually, so oh, sorry. The Trillium Gift of Life actually manages the living donor right. uh, component of it, and uh, Canadian Blood Services actually manages the um, uh, the Canadian Blood Services actually manages the uh, uh, deceased donor list. So if you if you if you don't have a uh, paired exchange or a, a living donor, then you would just go on, if you're eligible, so you'd work with your nephrologist, indicate your desire to uh, be worked up for a transplant, and then you would go on the transplant waiting list, and and then that uh, is, uh, it's not a, a straight number, it's not the next person in line because it depends on things like your, your blood type and your antibodies and a few other things. So, uh, just because if you're sitting in the waiting room and you find out that you've been waiting on the transplant list longer than anyone, doesn't mean necessarily that the next kidney will go to you. So it, it, it is a list in that um, you're either on it or you're not on it, but it's not a time-based list. It, does, it doesn't mean that the, the next kidney goes to the person that's been on the longest. There's a few other factors. Uh, so say if, if you have 100 people, how many people would Uh, I don't know what the rates are right now. Um, that's a good question. I think that's something we can find out and get back to you if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you guys know what the curious. transplant rate is? I don't know what the rate is yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. I could guess, but it's not, it would be strictly a guess. Yeah. It wouldn't be very high, I know that. No, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. It's not 50%, I know that. Oh, no, I wouldn't have thought yeah. that. Right? <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Five to six years. The wait list? Yeah. How come I don't people are available? I've been out of the transplant game for a long time, so I don't know. It, again, like I, I was saying before, like we try not to, like when we talk about it, it's not, you don't really want to get in that mode of like, okay, I, I'm in my six and a half year and the wait is seven years. It could be 10 years depending on your blood type. And it, you could get, I, I work with a guy on the, uh, on the ORN PFAC, he was on the list for three and a half years. So it, it just, uh, it really depends on your own personal situation, your antibodies and the, what kidneys become available. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say like, people love to put a number out there and it gives you something to focus on in the future, but it rarely <laughs> is, that, that number is an average. And it, it's an average with a, a very broad, uh, like low and upper end. One thing that they are doing right now that is, I think it's really exciting and cool, is that they're doing a sort of chain of transplants. So that say if you know someone that's willing to donate, but they're not a match for you, there may, there may be someone else that they're a match for, and maybe it can work down the chain so that you receive a kidney in the end. And I think there's, I, th I remember talking, they reached something like a chain of like 14 people, yeah. the highest, and just to think all those people were able to receive some. Kind of like it's a into the Pardon? Kind of like getting into the bartering system. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Except someone in the middle doesn't get a car. Everyone's <laughs> getting a kidney. I'm not going to spare a kidney. <laughs> 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 Did you have another question? You said, I thought you said you had I, I did. I, I did. It was concerning the kidney uh, transplant list. Um, is there... Uh, if you have a choice to make between dialysis and transplant, and you're at the point of, uh, um, say, within that 10% kidney function, um, where do you go to get the information on the kidney transplant? Um, so you're not on dialysis yet? Or in your example, the person's no. not on dialysis yet? So in that case, someone would be followed in what's called the uh, multi-care kidney clinic, the MCKC. Uh, and I, I forget the number now. People are referred there usually around 40%, 50%, somewhere around there. Um, there there's a number where you're, you'll, um, 
like if everything goes according to plan, your family doctor would recognize that maybe you have high blood pressure or something and do a kidney function test on you. They, your family doctor would monitor, monitor you to a point where um, you can be referred to a nephrology program and then you would be followed by a nephrologist and then it's in there that you would start the discussion with your nephrologist about as your kidney function goes down, um, what do you want to do? Do you want to prep for a transplant? Do you want to prep for dialysis, meaning get a fistula put in or get a, a PD catheter put in? Um, so the idea is that you get all that stuff done ahead of time so that you don't end up in a merge, really sick, and getting all this done in an emergency situation. But the idea is um, that you want to, to manage it as best as possible. So do they establish a care plan then at that yes. point? Yeah, so okay. uh, when you get referred to, I, the reason I know this, I actually, uh, my old boss, uh, his uh, mother-in-law, was diagnosed with uh, kidney disease by her family doctor, and when she was referred to the MC Casey Clinic up in uh, Richmond Hill, she asked me to go with her. So I got to see the process that I never experienced because I just literally came in by ambulance to the emergency room here at St. Mike's when I was 18. Um, so I got to see the whole process. Uh, so she met with the nephrologist. Her kidney function was above 50% or 55% at the time. Um, they uh, they set her up to meet with the renal uh, dietitian, the renal pharmacist, so they looked at some of her medications that might be harming her kidneys, um, and they gave her a full care plan to make that time between, because at, at 55%, she felt great, like she was felt completely normal. She, all she knew was she had some abnormal blood work. Um, and so the whole idea was that she could manage the time between when she was feeling fine at 55% and if her kidneys continued to decline, uh, she wanted to make that time as long as possible. So they said maybe it'll be five years, but maybe it'll be 10 years if you really take care of yourself. So she was really motivated to make it 10 years because she didn't want to have to deal with dialysis and a trans or a transplant, and I can't blame her. Thank you. But yeah, the MC Casey Clinic is the <coughs> short answer where all this discussion happens. And you yeah, should get a... actually a modality educator in our MCKC clinic who goes over the you know, options at a certain level and patients, the GFR at a certain level. So patients in MCKC at some point will meet with the modality educator. So modality is the word for mm -hmm. the collection okay. of either dialysis or transplant or what type of dialysis or conservative care, if that's your choice. So you said that nocturnal dialysis was much more gentle. Do they encourage that, that when people go on dialysis, that this would be the best So the, the, the standard language is the best treatment for, the, for each person. So we, like it's not it for me it's worth the best of the ones i've tried i haven't spent very much time on peritoneal so maybe peritoneal would work for me but i've never tried it but um it it depends on your own personal situation so um certainly more dialysis is better than less dialysis i think we can all agree on that but um you know if you don't have very good veins you can't get a very good access for hemodialysis then hemo or, uh, nocturnal might not be for you. Um, and same thing, there's people that have been on peritoneal for years that have never thought about trying hemo either. So really, I mean, the reason there are different modalities are some things work better for some people and other things different. work better for other people. That's, I think that's why we, a big reason why we changed the name to that multi-care kidney clinic instead of saying pre-dialysis, because what that means is you have a whole team here at St. Mike's that will look at every aspect of you as a person, get to know you really well, get to know your values, the things that are important to you, and really give you a full assessment of like what options are available to you. And then from what I, I know, they're a really hardworking bunch here. They'll do everything they can to make sure you get as many options as possible and get that option you want. It's just, it's a really wonderful system that they have set up here that makes sure that they look at every possible venue like that. And I really like the name. Yeah. 
Are there any other questions or comments? When I wake up in the morning, I feel like an old man. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's a good comment. <laughs> I wake up smiling. <laughs> I like your comment better. <laughs> So if there's no more questions, I just wanted to say thank you very much to Mark coming to talk to us about the Ontario Renal Network. And thank you to our surprise guest this afternoon, Michael McCormick, for sharing some of his dialysis experience with us. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And we'll resume our sessions in September, different topics. So watch for our flyers and information. Oh, nice.